which everything is possible and nothing, nothing is beyond you. This is the story of the rise of an idea that has come to dominate our society. It is the belief that the satisfaction of individual feelings and desires is our highest priority. Today we're going to tell you how to get whatever you want. I wanted to live a different life that wasn't available to me in the image I was born. I am here, look at me, notice me. Previous episodes have shown how this rise of the self was fostered and promoted by business. They had used the ideas of Sigmund Freud to develop techniques to read the inner desires of individuals and then fulfill them with products. This final episode is about how that idea took over politics. It tells the story of how politicians on the left, in both America and Britain, turned to these techniques to regain power. They believed that they were creating a new and better form of democracy, one that truly responded to the inner feelings of individuals. But what the politicians didn't realise was that the aim of those who had originally created these techniques had not been to liberate the people, but to develop a new way of controlling them in an age of mass democracy. The roots of the story lie way back in the America of the 1920s with one man. He was called Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Bernays had been one of the inventors of the profession of public relations, and he was fascinated by his uncle's theory that human behavior was driven by unconscious sexual and aggressive drives. Many of Bernays' clients were large American corporations, and he was the first person to show them how they could sell many more products if they linked them through images and symbols to those unconscious desires that Freud had identified. The strategy he offered them was that people could now look at the goods that were emerging within this society and not merely view those goods as things that they needed in order to deal with some specific material want, but also as goods which would stroke and respond to deep emotional yearnings. You know, how this bar of soap or this bag of flour will make you a happier, more successful, more sexually appealing, less fearful person. Somebody to be admired rather than reviled. The powerful people in that world are those people who are capable of reading the public mind and giving the public uh, what it wants in those terms. And Bernays was at the heart of it. Bernays was the guy who was the foremost articulator of the theories which were driving this new system. By the 1980s, Bernays' ideas had come of age. A vast industry had grown up in America, devoted to reading the inner desires of consumers. At its heart was the technique of the focus group. Previous episodes have shown how the focus group was invented by psychoanalysts employed by US corporations. The aim was to allow consumers to express their inner feelings and needs, just as patients did in psychoanalysis. The information was then used to promote and design new products that would fulfill those desires. And Edward Bernays, who was now nearly a hundred years old, was celebrated as the founding father of this marketing world. Hi, Doctor. Good to see you. Come on up over here. There you go. Doctor, what? Uh, tell me again what the doctor is. What are we dealing with well, here? You're the father of uh, public relations. What we're dealing with really is the concept that people will believe me more if you call me doctor. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a good idea. And Bernays' ideas and techniques were also about to conquer Britain in the 1980s. Unlike America, the ruling elites in Britain had always distrusted the idea of pandering to the masses. It was epitomized by the patrician elite who ran the BBC. Even as late as the 60s, popular programmes were referred to as ground bait. Their real job was to lure the viewers into watching the more serious programmes the elite knew was good for them. 
and market research reflected this attitude. Individuals were observed and classified by market researchers according to their social class from A through C2, D and E. Probably they might be C2. Yes, I think uh, by the, the way they're carrying their luggage, or yes, no taxi, you know, no taxi, and all stuffed in, in the bags yes. like that. I think the lady possibly sets her own hair, which is always yes. an indication. Yes. The children are nicely dressed. Yes, they are. Uh, Yes. Probably uh, a skilled uh, worker, a skilled, some, yes, some yes, a skilled worker. I, I would think say so. so. Yes, With I would say so. A certain apprenticeship or done some That's quali right. yes. qualifying. Time. We agree then. Yes, we C2? think C2. We think so. Yes. When people were asked their opinion about both products and politics, they were selected by social class and asked only strictly factual questions about what they thought. Well, leaving your own party sympathies on one side, who do you think will win this forthcoming uh, election? Labour. Labour. And tell me which you prefer. Which party do you think you'll be voting for? This time, this the time Liberals. You'll be voting for the Liberals. And who do you think will be second? Conservative. This one. Thank you. The idea that one might ask people what they themselves felt and desired, and then give it to them, was seen as alien to the ruling elites, which would challenge their belief that they knew what was best for the public. There's evidence uh, in other countries, in the United States, for example, where pollsters have been used before elections to interpret the mood of the public, and then you uh, give people uh, more what they want to have and less what they ought to have. But again, you, this could be alleged to be more democratic. I don't know. It's very dangerous ground, I think, though, when polls are used uh, in that way. But then, in the economic crisis of the mid-70s, British industry was forced to begin to pay attention to the inner feelings of consumers. As the recession deepened, consumer spending fell dramatically, and the advertisers insisted that the only way for companies to survive was to make their advertising more effective. And to do this, they would have to delve into people's underlying psychological motives for purchasing. The advertising industry started to bring in Americans to run focus groups with British housewives. Everyone is a unique person, and even though you're a group of ten today, we don't want a group opinion, and we want to know your ideas and your thoughts, no matter how crazy it might be. Please let your imagination run wild, because that's how very crazy things like instant coffee got born. Now, can we get somebody, this lady, to be a kitchen sink? Yeah. And kitchen sink, how do you feel with these things that are being used to clean you up? Well, I've got to feel clean. I've got to be kept clean. So you're I feel that. I should hate it if I was all greasy, so I've got to be easy to clean. Okay. Now, the housewife, this lady, what would you use to clean your kitchen sink? Um, a scouring powder. Of course, a cloth to apply the things on, and plenty of water. Now, how do you feel as you're doing this chore? Um, you feel satisfied? Well right? satisfied when I have done it, yes. I'm doing my duty. I feel it's a job well done. The consumers were encouraged to play at being products, from household cleaners to car seat belts. The aim was not to talk rationally, but to act out and reveal their inner emotional relationship to products. <laughs> Which firmly and unmistakably underlines and then a politician emerged who also believed that people should be allowed to express themselves. Instead of being controlled by the state, the individual should become the central focus of society. Some socialists seem to believe that people should be numbers in a state computer. We believe they should be individuals. We're all unequal. No one, thank heavens, is quite like anyone else, however much the socialists may pretend otherwise. And we believe that everyone has the right to be unequal. But to us, every human being is equally important. A man's right to work as he will, to spend what he earns, to own property, to have the state as servant and not as master, they are the essence of a free economy. And on that freedom, all our other freedoms depend. 
Mrs. Thatcher's vision was of a society in which the wants and desires of millions of individuals would be satisfied through the free market. This, she believed, would be the engine to regenerate Britain. And with her ascent to power, the advertising and marketing industries flourished. Their task was to find out what the British people really wanted and then sell it to them. In this new climate, the focus group flourished. And those who ran them borrowed from the techniques of psychotherapy to delve ever deeper into people's feelings about products. We're trying to understand how people feel about brands, how they relate to brands. That is to say, what the brand's personality is as far as consumers are concerned. And there are a number of techniques which are very, very helpful for uh, getting to that, uh, to that understanding. The consumer is given crayons to doodle, to express their feelings, to go inside their own head, pull out their feelings and somehow get them onto paper. And these are ordinary drinkers uh, expressing their feelings about drinking Guinness. Here you see a rich, very female aspect of Guinness. So if you were describing a woman who somehow, to you, had that character, what sort of person is it? Paula Yates, who used to lay in bed, surrounded with magazines and chocolates, like a 50s starlet. Out of this research, the marketeers began to detect a new individualism. In particular, among those who had voted Conservative for the first time in 1979, they no longer wanted to be seen as part of social classes, but to express themselves. And crucial to this were the products they chose to buy. We identified that there was this trend towards what might be called individualism, where people wanted to still be part of a crowd, but to express themselves as individuals within it, to have their own personalities, to be, I suppose, their own men. I didn't want to be the same as everybody else. I wanted it to be a little bit different, a little bit individual. It's quite individual upstairs. It's not remarkable, but I think it's quite individual. It is expensive. It's Italian. It's Italian, it's, it's expensive, and it's good quality. A we little bit set, different. Yeah, we want to set our own standards so nobody else has got what we've got. We just didn't want it. Be the else. same as everybody we else. We just want to be different. Business responded eagerly to this new individualism, but it soon became one of the main forces driving the growing consumer boom in Britain. Using the data from the focus groups, the manufacturers created new ranges of products that allowed people to express their individuality. Business also recategorized people. They were no longer divided by social class, but by their inner psychological needs. If the primary need is security and belonging, we call the groups mainstreamers. Um, if it's status and the esteem of others, then it's aspirants. If it's control, it's succeeders, and if it's self-esteem, it's reformers. And this new marketing culture began to take over the institutions previously dominated by a patrician elite, in particular the world of journalism. The assault was led by the profession of public relations. In the past, PR had been seen as seedy and corrupt, but now it became a glamorous business, promoting products and celebrities. And one of the rising stars was another member of the Freud family, Matthew Freud, the son of the Liberal MP, Clement. What Freud and other PRs realised was that they could use their celebrities as levers to infiltrate advertising into the editorial content of newspapers. The newspapers were offered exclusive interviews with celebrities, but only if they also agreed to mention products made by Freud's corporate clients, in terms dictated by the company. What happened with Freud's was that you effectively got some kind of product placement or even product, the manufacturers of the product got some degree of control over how their products would appear in print. So if, for example, you did want to write about Caprice's uh, passion for stuffed crust pizza, you would sign a contract which guaranteed that you would mention the firm Pizza Hut uh, in at least twice uh, in certain positions in the introductory paragraph of, of, of the article. That you would agree to run the Pizza Hut logo at such and such a size in such and such a place. And of course that you would agree to run the enclosed pictures of Caprice eating her stuffed crust pizza. There was no choice about how you would run this article in the press. You were effectively told how to run the article in the press. By Freud's. By Freud's. It's a rise of the corporate culture and the rise of, of business. 
To traditional journalists, this infiltration of advertising into the editorial pages was a corruption of their profession. But to Mrs. Thatcher's allies, like Rupert Murdoch, who owned The Sun and The Times, it was part of a democratic revolution against an arrogant elite who had too long ignored the feelings of the masses. They hate to see someone communicating with the masses. They feel that newspapers, the written word is not for the masses. That should be left to television, or perhaps to nobody. You I'm very proud of The Sun. And the sum was not represented tonight in your film. You just took page three, which everyone seems so fascinated with. How about page one, page two, every other page of the paper? It was a typical piece of slanting and elitism by the BBC, who, after all, in order to get viewers for this program, put on a very sexy episode of Star Trek, just which I was watching out in the room there. Oh, I don't think they put it on to get us viewers. I think we just are lucky to they follow They try to carry viewers into these show programs. You, you, you I don't know how it's done. By the late 80s, Mrs. Thatcher and her allies in advertising and the media had brought the desires of the individual to the centre of society. As last week's episode showed, it was the same transformation that President Reagan had brought about in America. Both politicians had encouraged business to take over from government the role of fulfilling the needs of the people. In the process, consumers were encouraged to see the satisfaction of their desires as the overriding priority. To Thatcher and Reagan, this was a new and better form of democracy. But to their opponents in the parties of the left, they had summoned up the most selfish and greedy aspects of human nature. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher both embraced an economic philosophy that says the unit of judgment was not only the individual, but it was the individual's personal satisfaction, the individual's own unique happiness and well-being. It was, in a sense, the triumph of regarding individuals as purely emotional beings who have needs and wants and desires that need to be satisfied and can be satisfied unconsciously. It goes way back to the early part of the 20th century, to Freud, to notions of the unconscious, um, the assumptions that we are, uh, in terms of our rational minds, we're little corks bobbing around on this great sea of hopes and fears and, and desires of which we are only dimly aware. And that the role of a marketer, uh, the role of somebody selling something, including a politician, is to appeal to this great swamp of, of desire, of unconscious desire. The left believed the opposite, that the way to create a better society was not to treat people as emotional, isolated individuals, but to persuade them to realize that they had common interests with others, to help them rise above their individual feelings and fears. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. This idea had flourished in America in the depression of the 1930s. President Roosevelt, faced with the chaos caused by the Wall Street crash, encouraged Americans to join together in trades unions to set up consumer groups, and to pay for a welfare system for those trapped in poverty. His aim was to create a collective awareness which would become a powerful weapon against the unfettered power of capitalism which had caused the crisis. That idea had driven the Democratic Party for 50 years. But now, Roosevelt's inheritors railed vainly against the effects of the self-interest encouraged by President Reagan. There is despair, Mr. President, in the faces that you don't see. Maybe, Mr. President, if you stopped in at a shelter in Chicago and spoke to the homeless there. Maybe, Mr. President, if you asked a woman who had been denied the help she needed to feed her children because you said you needed the money for a tax break for a millionaire or for a missile we couldn't afford to use. The worst thing Ronald Reagan did was to make the denial of compassion respectable. 
He said, you've worked hard. You've made your money. You shouldn't have to uh, feel guilty about refusing to throw it away on people who choose to be homeless and who choose not to work. That's what he said. He said it with an elegance and a kind of benign aspect that disguised its harshness. You think we can't do anything about it? Well, why not? If we can work together now to look after the lives of the people here, I don't see why we couldn't work together afterwards to clear up the mess and help build a better world in which these things can't possibly happen. The qualities we've learned from comradeship and common suffering are not going to be wasted after this war. It's out of experience like ours that the new world will be built. That same idea of marshalling the collective force of the masses to challenge the entrenched power of wealth and business had also led the Labour Party to power in Britain after the war. But in the 80s, Labour, like the Democrats in America, lost election after election, as millions who had once voted for them switched their allegiance to the Conservatives. There it is, going blue just about everywhere, sweeping the country, the rural parts of Britain now have gone blue. For they are the party of yesterday, and tomorrow is ours. In the face of this, a growing number within the Labour Party became convinced that if they were ever to regain power, Labour would have to come to terms with the new individualism. One of them was an advertising executive called Philip Gould, who had been a lifelong Labour supporter. Gould believed that Labour's leadership had become corrupted by the same patrician arrogance that dominated all Britain's institutions. They denigrated and disapproved of the new aspirations of working class voters. Labour stopped listening to these people. And I remember uh, the best example of this was after the election of 1983, which was the election above all, where the people's voices just were not heard. And I had dinner with a leading uh, Labour Party figure who'd been involved in the defeat, heavily involved in, involved in the defeat, and his wife said, God, these working class people, these working class people, they just, you know, we give them education, we give them chances in life, what do they do? They read the sun and they just don't vote for us. And there was such a gap between these people just trying to make lives for themselves, better lives for themselves, and the kind of elitism of the Labour Party that was just such a chasm that, 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 that had to be filled. Gould became part of a small group of modernisers centred around Peter Mandelson. Their aim was to reconnect Labour with the lost voters. To do this, Gould turned to the technique he knew well from his work in advertising, the focus group. Gould commissioned focus groups in suburban areas across the country with small groups of voters who had switched to Mrs Thatcher. People were encouraged not to talk rationally about policies, but to express their underlying feelings. And what Gould discovered was a fundamental shift in people's relationship to politics. They no longer saw themselves as part of any group, but as individuals who could demand things from politicians in return for paying taxes, just as business had taught them to do as consumers. And I found that the people had become consumers. People now wanted to have, you know, politics and life on their own terms. I mean, not just in politics, but in all aspects of life too. People see themselves as they are, as autonomous, powerful individuals who are entitled to be respected, who are entitled to have the best, not just in, um, you know, uh, going to, to, to Tesco's or wherever, but the best in terms of health and in education too. All this was about getting the Labour Party to understand that people really, really, really had changed and the Labour Party had not, and unless the Labour Party changed, it would not win. Philip Gould now set out to try and persuade the Labour Party that they would have to make concessions to what he called the new aspirational classes. But he was going to face implacable opposition. In the run-up to the 1992 election, Gould argued that the only way to win was for Labour to promise not to put up taxes. But the Shadow Chancellor, John Smith, angrily refused. Labour would stick to its fundamental policies. They would fight the election with the promise of tax increases to create a fairer society. And as the campaign began, it seemed as if Philip Gould was wrong. The traditional polls consistently showed Labour ahead, 
despite the Conservative campaign message that a Labour government would put up taxes. Even the Conservatives' oldest allies in the press became convinced that by harping on about tax, the Conservatives were cutting their own throats. So the worry about the Tories must be that they're not, at the moment, conveying a sense of grip and being in control. And unless they can do better than that, I think they're going to lose. But is, the other thing is that they still say that they are going to go on and on with this one single message of tax. And I think I mean, part of the difficulty this morning was that you had a whole lot of uh, people who've been going to the same press conference for seven days, had virtually the same message yeah. thrust at them, and are, are kind of getting bored and restless and hitting back on it. I think the media sense a big story coming yeah. in the Tories being defeated. And the Labour Party, too, was convinced it would win and finally return to power. It's now time to meet the men and women who will form the next government. <laughs> Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer, John Smith. And now, it is time, time for the next Prime Minister, Neil Kinnock. Those running Labour's campaign believed that by modern presentation, they would attract back the voters, yet keep the old policies. But Philip Gould was convinced that Labour were going to lose. Through his focus groups, he knew that the very people who were telling the traditional pollsters they would vote Labour were in reality preparing to vote Conservative out of self-interest. But they were too embarrassed to admit it. And John Major also knew this because his focus groups were telling him the same thing. Make of the poll which puts Labour five points ahead. It's feeling good on the streets. It is feeling good on the streets, yes. It has been feeling surprisingly good on the streets for some time. Quite surprisingly, quite out of line with uh, opinion polls. Don't ask me to explain it, but the deal's all right. Sir? Anyway, go on. No, lads, you must sit down. We're waiting to go. John Major's victory in 1992 was a disaster for the Labour Party. A small group of reformers centred around Peter Mandelson and Philip Gould were convinced that the only way for the party to survive was to change its basic policies. But their ideas were rejected by John Smith, who had now become leader. Philip Gould left Britain to go to work for the campaign to elect Bill Clinton president in America. The 1992 election during it and afterwards, people felt under great strain and really did feel demoralised and dejected. And then to go from this to the Clinton campaign, it was an extraordinary experience because here suddenly I found articulated many of the ideas that I'd had but not fully myself been able to encapsulate or to articulate. If you want a president who will restore the middle class, reclaim the future for the middle class and restore the American dream, Vote for Bill Clinton in New Hampshire and send a signal to the country that we are coming together. Thank what Gould discovered was that, like the Labour Party, the Democrats had also been doing focus groups with swing voters. The difference was that Bill Clinton had decided to tailor his policies to fit with these voters' desires. Above all, with their ferocious belief that they should only pay tax for things that benefited them, not for the welfare of others. I have no idea what percentage of my tax dollars go to welfare, but uh, even if it's a minuscule percentage, you know, even if it's a quarter of per a percent, you know, it's still too much for the people that are receiving these benefits that, that are basically non-productive. The Clinton team decided that to win, they had to promise tax cuts for these suburban voters. And they also used the focus groups throughout the campaign to check every appearance, speech, and policy with them for their approval. What Clinton called the forgotten middle class became central figures in a new type of reactive politics. Candidates for the presidency of the United States had been prepackaged and designed for many, many years. What was new was an attempt to use very sophisticated or pseudo-sophisticated techniques to plumb the public psychology, to find out precisely what the desires of the individuals were, and then to come up with a candidate and a platform and 
images and words that exactly responded to those deep desires. This was packaging at a new level. This was polling uh, at an extreme. I'm not going to raise taxes on the middle class. And the middle class needs a break. Government is in the way. It's taking more of your money and giving you less in return. In the name of the hardworking Americans who make up our forgotten middle class, I proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. Stay focused. Talk about things that matter to people. You know? It's the economy, stupid. Okay? But Clinton's campaign team, led by James Carville and George Stephanopoulos, did not believe that they were capitulating to the selfish desires of the middle classes. Tax cuts were the price they had to pay to regain power. But once in power, they would still fulfill traditional democratic policies and help the poor who had been neglected under Reagan, above all with the reform of health care. They would pay for the tax cuts by cutting defence spending and increasing taxes on the very rich. In this way, they believed they were forging a coalition of the new and the old voters, both of whom could be satisfied. Probably for the first time in a generation tomorrow, we're going to win. And that means that more people are going to have better jobs, people are going to pay a little less for health care, get better care, and uh, more kids are going to go to better schools. Uh, so thanks. But the Democrats' optimism was to be short-lived. In November 1992, Clinton was triumphantly elected president. But within weeks, his administration discovered that the budget deficit was far greater than they had anticipated. At a meeting in the White House in January 1993, the head of the Federal Reserve told them that the deficit was nearly $300 billion. There was no way they could borrow any more without panicking the markets and causing a crisis. The only way to pay for the proposed tax cuts would be to cut government spending, not just on defence, but on welfare. Clinton was faced with a choice between the old politics and the new, and he chose the old. The tax cuts were dropped, and he tried to inspire the country with the old democratic ideal of government spending to help the poor and disadvantaged. Tonight I want to talk with you about what government can do because I believe government must do more to put people to work now, to create a half a million jobs, jobs to rebuild our highways and airports, to renovate housing, to bring new life to rural communities and spread hope and opportunity among our nation's youth. Healthcare reform sounds like a great idea to me. Well, I know, but some of these details sure scare the heck out of me. Like what? Well, like for At the start of the Clinton administration, many of us, including, I believe, uh, President Clinton himself, uh, reverted back to an older tradition, tried to lift the public, to talk about genuine ideals uh, beyond the individual. And that reform agenda being not only universal health care and child care and dealing with the widening inequalities in our society and homelessness, many things that many citizens, just particularly middle-income citizens, didn't want to deal with. But the suburban voters who had been promised tax cuts were not inspired by Bill Clinton's vision. They felt betrayed and wanted revenge. Their opportunity came in 1994 with the congressional elections. The Republicans, led by Newt Gingrich, promised huge tax cuts and to dismantle the welfare system. The voters who had defected to Clinton switched sides yet again, and the Republicans won both houses of Congress in a landslide. Well, I think it's a tremendous vote in favor of smaller government, lower taxes, and in a sense, a renewal of the Thatcher-Reagan tradition. And I think in that sense, it's pretty decisive. It means that the welfare state is going to be less hospitable for people who are not willing to take responsibility for their own situation. No question about it. I think this is, today is the beginning of the end of the welfare state. For Clinton, it was a disaster. Faced with a hostile Congress, there was no way for him to get his reforms through. His personal popularity plummeted, and it seemed certain he would not be re-elected in two years' time. In desperation and without telling his cabinet, Clinton turned for help to one of America's most ruthless political strategists, Dick Morris. 
what did he want you to do? Save his butt. <laughs> Clinton was in serious trouble. Uh, he had uh, lost the 94 election. He had lost control of Congress, and he hired me to come back and help save him. Uh, so he was basically asking me to perform roughly the same role as a life preserver would if you're drowning. What Morris told Clinton was that to win re-election, he would have to transform the very nature of politics. The crucial swing voters in the suburbs now thought and behaved like consumers. The only way to win them back was to forget all ideology and instead turn politics into a form of consumer business. Clinton must try to identify their personal desires and whims and then promise to fulfill them. If he followed those consumer rules, they would follow him. I said that I felt the most important thing for him to do was to bring to the political system the same consumer rules philosophy that, we, that the business community has. Because I think politics needs to be as responsive to the whims and the desires of the marketplace as business is. Uh, and it should, needs to be as sensitive to the bottom line, profits or votes, as a business is. I think that all of this involves really a changed view of the voters. So that instead of treating them as targets, you treat them as owners. Instead of treating them as someone, it's something that you can manipulate, you treat them as something you need to learn from. And instead of feeling that you can stay in one place and you can manipulate the voters, you need to learn what they want and move yourself to accommodate it. To get inside the minds of the swing voters, Morris brought lifestyle marketing into politics for the first time. He went to one of America's most prominent market research firms called Penn and & Schoen and commissioned what they called a neuropersonality poll. It was a massive survey of hundreds of thousands of voters, but the only political questions it asked were to find out whether someone was a swing voter or not. All the other questions were intimate psychological ones, designed to see whether swing voters fell into identifiable psychological types. Well, we were asking people like, um, you know, do you think you're the life of the party? Uh, do you think uh, when, you, when you see things that uh, you like to have a list and organize them? Uh, do, you, uh, <clears throat> do you typically uh, you know, try to plan things ahead or do you like to be more spontaneous? Uh, where do you like to go? What sports do you like to play? What would you do with your spouse in a romantic uh, weekend? So we were asking people some very personal questions about their own lives. To try to see where the kinds of people that were likely to change their vote also possessing of certain kinds of personality traits and in fact they were. The neuropersonality poll allowed the Clinton team to segment swing voters into different lifestyle types. They were given names like pools and patios or caps and gowns who were urban intellectuals living in university towns. From this the team could identify ways in which they could make individuals feel more secure in their chosen lifestyles, just as business had learned to do with products. Dick Morris called it small bore politics, tiny details of people's lives and personal anxieties, which politics had never even thought about or noticed before, but which now had become the key to winning power. It was an America that focused on day-to-day -day practical concerns. Should I wear seat belts? Should I stop smoking? Uh, should I wear a school uniform? Uh, is my neighborhood being protected? It was a, not so much a new individualism as the social order as we had known it had broken down. So we got into people's heads, understood their psychology about lifestyle, about values, what they thought was important, what issues they wanted politicians and particularly the president to address. And these issues proved to be very, very different from what the conventional wisdom had suggested. As the election campaign began, Clinton revealed Morris's new approach to a shocked White House. All traditional policies were to be dropped. Instead, he would concentrate exclusively on policies that targeted the worries of the swing voters. V-chips would be fitted into televisions to prevent children from watching pornography and mobile phones would be fitted into school buses to make parents feel more secure. Dick Morris also persuaded the president to spend his leisure time 
in the same way as particular groups of swing voters. He sent Clinton on a hunting holiday, dressed in exactly the Gore-Tex outfits a group called Big Sky Families liked. The aim was to reflect swing voters' lifestyles back to them. The Liberals in Clinton's cabinet hated this approach. And I would say, well, Dick, why have a campaign? This was the 1996 campaign. If all the president is going to do is offer up these little bite-sized miniature initiatives that appeal to people's uh, desires, uh, like consumers, buying soap, uh, a V-chips that you could put in your tele televisions so you could make sure that your children did not have pornography and, and school uniforms. Uh, why talk about them? They're, they're, they're so mundane and they're so tiny. And he would say back, if we don't do this, we may not get re-elected. Uh, and I would say, what's the point of getting, getting re-elected if you have no mandate to do anything when you're re-elected? And he'd say, what's the point of having a mandate if you can't get re-elected? isn't the ultimate goal getting re-elected. <laughs> but Morris's new politics were an extraordinary success. Clinton's ratings among the swing voters began to soar. And Dick Morris, along with the marketeer Mark Penn, took effective charge of making White House policy. Mark Penn set up a huge call center in an office block in Denver. And every night, hundreds of telephone operators called swing voters in suburbs across the country to check with them every detail of policies that Clinton was proposing. The policy was made by a group of people manning telephones in Denver, Colorado, placing calls to voters in places like Westchester and uh, Pasadena and asking them what they wanted from their government um, and asking them very specifically about specific policies that Bill Clinton was considering. Would you be more likely to support him if he offered this particular government service, or if he offered that one. Those people told them what they thought. Mark Penn transmitted that to Bill Clinton, and it came out of his mouth. So essentially, it was suburbanite voters. Suburban voters in the 90s were creating American domestic policy, and some of its foreign policy as well. Right. Yeah, Mark Penn was polling on questions like whether we should bomb in Bosnia, things like that. Morris also insisted that Clinton make a symbolic sacrifice of the old politics to convince the swing voters to trust him. In August 1996, Clinton signed a bill which ended the system of guaranteed help for the poor and unemployed. Welfare would be cut back after two years in order to force people into work. The new system was called welfare to work and would, he said, be a hand up, not a hand out. It was the effective end of the guaranteed welfare system created by President Roosevelt 60 years before. For many in Clinton's cabinet, it was also the end of the progressive political ideal that Roosevelt had represented. The belief that one used a position of leadership to persuade the voters to think and behave as social beings, not as self-interested individuals. Dick Morris and the pollsters had won. And by that I mean that the people who ultimately got to the president, shaped the president's mind, were those who viewed the voters as just a collection of individual desires that had to be catered to and pandered to. It suggests that democracy is nothing more, and should be nothing more, than pandering to these unthought about, very primitive desires. Primitive in the sense that they are not even necessarily conscious of uh, just what people want in terms of satisfying themselves. And the same triumph of the politics of the self was about to happen in Britain too. In 1994, Tony Blair had become the leader of the Labour Party, and the reforming group centred around Peter Mandelson became all powerful. Almost every night, Philip Gould ran focus groups with swing voters in the suburbs. But this time, he was listened to, and the desires and the fears of the new aspirational classes became the central force shaping Labour Party policies. In that period, I was talking to people who used to vote Conservative and were considering voting Labour, and they wanted understood that they are financially pressed and that there are limits to uh, the extent to which taxation can be improved. They, they think that crime is an issue that matters to them and should be uh, respected. They 
You know, they want welfare to go to people who deserve welfare, not to people um, who do not. This was seen of by many in the Labour Party as selfish. I never saw that it was selfish. I believe that you know, a dad or a mum doing their best for their family isn't selfish. They're just doing their best for their family, and that's what people do. A crackdown on those who make life hell in their local neighbourhoods through noise or disturbance. Law and order is a Labour issue today. Philosophy of campaigning is let's concentrate on swing voters, let's focus group them to find out what they want and what will appeal to them, and let's just relentlessly push those themes in the election. Something is happening to you. After promising to put money in your pocket, the Conservatives are quietly taking it away. Philip Gould was, was crucial because he gave the raw material, if you like, for these politicians to do uh, this kind of politics. In that when he came up with stuff, they'd follow it, you know, pretty much without exception. Blur himself would pour over these sort of 12-page memos and say, well, this is what we must do. We want people to earn more, to consume the good things of life. We want people to pay lower taxes. <laughs> Gordon Brown says the Labour government would hold the main tax rates unchanged. The Labour government will not increase the basic rate of tax. I want to make it clear that I will not increase tax. In fact, the Labour Party does stand for Middle England. Those that aspire to do better, to get on in life, and be ambitious for themselves and their families will do better with Labour. Groups of eight people drinking wine and nibbling, you know, Cheerios, um, what, what they thought determined effectively everything that the Labour Party did. And although those running the campaign liked to portray the new approach as their invention, it was in fact copied from the Americans, even down to the phrases that the American marketeers had tested on their swing voters. Peter Mandelson and his team were in the United States watching what we did and copied almost verbatim our approach in their 1997 campaign. The benefit system should be about giving people a hand up, not just a hand out. Mandelson's not a fool if he's anything. He saw something that worked, so why not do it? And I can remember reading their manifesto and saying to myself, they just took it lock, stock, and barrel. You know, on one hand, you're proud, and on another hand, you're just a bitch. And as in America, Labour was forced to drop policies that would not directly benefit the swing voters even if it meant sacrificing its fundamental principles. The commitment to public control of industry, which was enshrined as Clause 4 of the party constitution, was dropped. The aim of Clause 4 had been to use the collective power of the people to challenge the unfettered greed of business. But now, Tony Blair was faced with crucial voters who no longer saw themselves as exploited by the free market. They saw themselves as individual consumers who were fulfilled and given identity by what business delivered them. The new Clause 4 promised not to control the free market, but to let it flourish. Business is more powerful than government. It is quicker, it is more creative. Business is the lifeblood of the country. From this come all the benefits that society needs, employment, investment. I think, frankly, there is only one party getting business right, and that's New Labour. What New Labour did it suits people who exert power in society not through the political system, or, or not through the democratic political system. So it suits big business, and it suits entrenched interest, and it suits the status quo. Um, you know, those three things, of course, just off the top of my head, being the things that the Labour Party is supposed to be, you know, a counterforce to. What that means is big business get to carry on exerting their power behind the scenes, getting their way, because there's no countervailing pressure. Countervailing pressure isn't going to come from, you know, eight people sipping wine in Kettering. Here he goes, turning an awful lot of other blue seats red as well. <laughs> Very happy, very relieved, very exhilarated. But those who masterminded Labour's victory in 1997 saw it as a triumphant vindication of a new form of democracy. By understanding and fulfilling people's inner desires through the focus group, they were giving power to individuals, 
not treating them as faceless groups who were told by politicians what was good for them. I don't believe, I don't see the focus group as some marketing tool. I see the focus group as a way of hearing what the people have to say. And I see the focus group as a way to a new form of politics. What the people give, the people can take away. We are the servants, they are the masters now. 1997 was, I think, fundamentally important in that. I think it is the end, the end of the uh, elitist politics that's dominated Britain for so much of the last uh, 100 years. In 1939, Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, created a vision of a future world in which the consumer was king. It was at the World's Fair in New York, and Bernays called it Democracy. It was one of the earliest and most dramatic portrayals of a consumerist democracy, a society in which the needs and desires of individuals were read and fulfilled by business and the free market. The World's Fair created a spectacle in which all of these concerns were met, and they were met by Westinghouse and General Motors and the American Cash Register Company, and company after company presented itself as this sort of centerpiece of a society in which human desire and human want and human anxiety would all be responded to and would be all be met purely through the free enterprise system. There was this sort of notion that the free market was something that was not guided by ideologies or by political power. It was something that simply was guided by the people's will. This was the model of democracy that both New Labour and the American Democrats had bought into in order to regain power. They had used techniques developed by business to read the desires of consumers, and they had accepted Bernays' claim that this was a better form of democracy. But in reality, the World's Fair had been an elaborate piece of propaganda designed by Bernays for his clients, the giant American corporations. Privately, Bernays did not believe that true democracy could ever work. He had been profoundly influenced in this by his uncle's theories of human nature. Freud believed that individuals were not driven by rational thought, but by primitive, unconscious desires and feelings. And Bernays believed that this meant it was too dangerous to let the masses ever have control over their own lives. And consumerism was a way of giving people the illusion of control, while allowing a responsible elite to continue managing society. It's not that the people are in charge, but that the people's desires are in charge. The people are not in charge. The people exercise no decision-making power within this environment. So democracy is reduced from something which assumes an active citizenry to something which now increasingly is predicated on the idea of the public as passive consumers, the public as people who essentially what you're delivering them or doggy treats. The problem for New Labour was that it believed the propaganda. They took at face value the idea promoted by business that the systems invented to read the consumer's mind could form the basis for a new type of democracy. Once in power, New Labour tried to govern through a system that Philip Gould called continuous democracy. But what worked for business in designing products led the Labour government into a bewildering maze of contradictory whims and desires. For much of Labour's first term, the focus group said that the railways were not a high priority, and Labour's policies faithfully reflected this. But now, those same groups are blaming the government for not having invested more money sooner in the railways. The point about focus group politics is that there isn't one because people are contradictory and irrational and so you have a problem in terms of deciding what you're going to do if all you do is actually listen to a mass of individual opinions that are forever fluctuating and don't really have any coherence and crucially are not set in context. 
So that's why people can say, you know, um, I want lower taxes and better public services. Of course they do. You know, if you say, um, do you want to pay more taxes to get better public services, people are less sure. They then don't believe that if they do pay more taxes, they will be spent on better public services. So you end up in this quagmire where, you know, and the truth is, a politician has to say, look, this is what I believe. I believe that you should pay slightly more taxes to, to make better public services, and I pledge that I'm competent enough to actually use that money wisely. Do you want that vote for me, yes or no? And that's what Blair has failed to do. Tony Blair turns around and sort of tries to feed back to them what they already believe. And given what, the, what they believe is sort of a load of individual um, in, incoherent, contradictory nonsense, that's all he has to offer. And then he wonders why people don't get him. You know, the answer they don't get him is because they're looking for someone to do something that they can't do themselves, which is actually come up with a coherent political opinion that they might have faith in. New Labour are faced with a dilemma. The system of consumer democracy that they have embraced has trapped them into a series of short-term and often contradictory policies. There are now growing demands that they fulfil a grand division, that they use the power of government to deal with the problems of growing inequality and the decaying social fabric of the country. But to do this, they will have to appeal to the electorate to think outside their own self-interest. And this would mean challenging the now dominant Freudian view of human beings as selfish, instinct-driven individuals, which is a concept of human beings that has been fostered and encouraged by business because it produces ideal consumers. Although we feel we are free, in reality, we, like the politicians, have become the slaves of our own desires. We have forgotten that we can be more than that that there are other sides to human nature. Fundamentally, here we have two different views of human nature and of democracy. You have the view that people are irrational, that they are bundles of unconscious emotion. Uh, that comes directly out of Freud. And businesses are very able to respond to that. That's what they have honed their skills doing. That's what marketing is really all about. What are the symbols, the music, the images, the words that will appeal to these unconscious feelings? Politics must be more than that. Politics and leadership are about engaging the public in a rational discussion and deliberation about what is best and treating people with respect in terms of their rational abilities to debate what is best. If it's not that, if it is Freudian, if it is basically a matter of appealing to the same basic unconscious feelings that business appeals to, then why not let business do it? Business can do it better. Business knows how to do it. Business, after all, is in the business of responding to those feelings. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I think to myself. What a wonderful world.